It's the 1980s, and you and your family are enjoying a well-deserved vacation at a luxury lakeside resort. The place is like a postcard, and life couldn't get any better. And then, just like that, nature unleashes its fury, and life there is changed forever. A small tourist town in Argentina went from luxury resort to a modern-day Atlantis. But now it's back to tell its story. This is the Mysteries of Latin America podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Mysteries of Latin America. I'm your host, Andrew Colon. Now, I've been a huge fan of mysteries, myths, legends, and stories for most of my life. One of the things I've discovered by living outside of the U.S. for a few decades is how little most people outside Latin America actually know about Latin America. And since I do love stories about the unknown and sometimes darker side of the spectrum, I've decided to share some of those stories here on the podcast. If this is your first time listening, gracias for spending some time with us. And I invite you to listen, share, and subscribe to the podcast to never miss an episode and check out some of our past shows. Some of those stories are too good to miss. And now, on to this week's episode. Now, in case you didn't know, I'm originally from Maryland and Florida in the U.S., but I've spent the last 30 years living and working here in the thriving tourist mecca that is Cancun, Mexico. Today, we're going to take a little trip to explore the story of another once thriving tourist hub. But that town met a very eerie fate. Join me as we uncover the secrets of Epic Wayne. Lake Epecuen is a shallow saltwater lagoon located about 600 kilometers or 375 miles southwest of Buenos Aires, Argentina. The lake covers an area of about 200 square kilometers, about 77 square miles at its fullest. So picture a lake a little bit larger than Washington, D.C., my birthplace. Not exactly a small body of water. One of the defining features of Lake Epecuen is its super high salt concentration believed to be 10 times saltier than the ocean. This salinity, combined with the presence of minerals, gave the lake a reputation for having almost miraculous healing properties. People from different parts of Argentina and beyond would visit Epecuen, seeking relief from ailments like arthritis, skin conditions, and rheumatism. Bathing in the lake's waters was believed to have therapeutic and rejuvenating effects. Lake Epecuen's unique characteristics eventually made it an attractive tourist destination. The town of Epecuen, situated on the shores of the lake, was first called Villa Epecuen, beginning over 130 years ago or so in the late 1880s. In the 1920s, luxury hotels, spas, restaurants, and activities came to the area, and by the 1950s, Epecuen thrived as a vibrant hub for tourism, as it was sold to people as the New Dead Sea. Visitors were drawn not only by the healing properties of the lake, but also by the picturesque surroundings, with lush landscapes and a serene ambiance. It was the ultimate destination for those seeking solace and relaxation, and later the lake became a popular spot for swimming, boating, and water sports, the perfect place for a family vacation and it made a great road trip at about seven hours away from the capital of Buenos Aires. The town boomed, hotels were built, and eventually about 1,500 people lived there permanently, and life thrived. As many as 25,000 visitors could be there at any given moment during tourism season. Life was good. Beginning in the 1970s, though, the level of the lake began to drop as part of its natural cycles of rising and falling as it was located in a semi-arid region. But with all the time, money, and effort put into this tourism cash cow, inhabitants and investors were beginning to be worried about a possible future lack of water, as businesses on the lake shores were already being affected. To meet the water needs of Epecuen, multiple sources were tapped and diverted to supply Epecuen with water. One significant source was the Salado River, located about 15 kilometers or 9 miles away from the town. 
The Salado River, along with a few other underground and smaller freshwater sources, served as a crucial water supply, providing a relatively abundant source of fresh water, and the water was transported by a network of pipes, canals, reservoirs, and pumping stations. The objective of this water supply system was to allow Epicuen to overcome its water scarcity challenges in the 1970s and to ensure a reliable supply for the town's tourism industry and residents for many years to come. Water levels rose satisfactorily, and Epicuen was back in business. But fate had a different plan for Epicuen. You're listening to the Mysteries of Latin America podcast. Remember to subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or wherever you're listening. A series of economic problems hit Argentina hard in the 1970s and it delayed the proper completion of the water system. And then its construction was suspended completely in 1976 when Argentina lived through a violent military coup and subsequent military dictatorship. In 1982 and 1983, the government began building a series of embankments to protect Epicuen. Soon, water levels in the lake climbed to previous levels because of nature and the water system improvements. But with the water system in dire need of maintenance, the year of 1985 was an especially wet one for Argentina and the town of Epecuen, because in six months the town had already received the amount of rain it normally got in a whole year. And then the unthinkable happened. On November 10, 1985, almost 100 years after its founding, disaster struck when the area is hit by what is known in Argentina as a sudestada, which in English can be translated as a southeaster, when gale force winds from the southeast as part of a severe storm system can bring intense and prolonged rainfall, high tides, rough seas, and flooding. This southeaster brought torrential rains that exceeded anything the town had experienced since its founding. After these heavy rains, the once tranquil lake's water levels rose to alarming heights, putting immense pressure on the aging and poorly maintained dam system that protected the town of Epecuen. And then, similar to the levees in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, the lake's water height breached the containment walls and the dam gave way. But it didn't happen all at once. Water levels rose little by little. But by 15 days after the embankment started to give way, the whole town was flooded in two meters, or six and a half feet, of water, and the water level kept climbing. The catastrophic event forced the entire population of Epecuen, around 1,500 residents, to evacuate their homes as quickly as they could. Fortunately, no lives were lost, as people did have time to evacuate, most of them to the nearby town of Carhué but they'd never get their homes or lives back. At its highest point, the floodwaters at Villa Epecuen reached a depth of up to 10 meters, about 33 feet, so almost enough to cover a three-story building. This flooding totally engulfed the town, leaving behind destruction and despair. Epecuen vanished beneath these unforgiving waters, submerging it in a watery grave. Homes, buildings, and the vibrant community that once thrived now lay abandoned and forgotten. In the aftermath of the flood, the town of Epecuen was left in ruins, submerged beneath a layer of salt and sediment. Its residents, who were forced to evacuate, left behind their homes, possessions, and their old lives to rebuild somewhere else. The glory days of the luxury resort of Epecuen were drowned in 30 feet of water, abandoned, hidden, and buried beneath the surface. But Epecuen's story doesn't end there. Nature and humanity always seem to have a way of reclaiming what's lost and bouncing back from tragedy. In 2009, the lake's waters slowly evaporated and retreated, revealing the eerie remnants of this ghost town. A surreal landscape emerged where time seemed frozen in a watery, post-apocalyptic version of the 1980s, and the echoes of the past linger everywhere. Trees were petrified, 
and buildings and homes were whitewashed by the salt and water. Most of the town's walls have tumbled down, and what's left now is a twisted, rusting, crumbling mass of debris. What's left of the once thriving tourist mecca are now its skeletal remains, reminding everyone of the town's tragic demise and how things can change in the blink of an eye, especially when we don't take care of them. But Epic Wen's story doesn't end there. As the town slowly emerges, so too does the spirit of its people. Former residents, some of them now elderly, have returned to visit their homes and old lives. Many of the town's people had to wait over 20 years to be able to visit their relatives who were buried in the town cemetery, as it slowly emerged from the retreating waters. Despite this desolation, hope begins to bloom in Epic Wen once again. The resurgence of interest in this forgotten town has sparked conversations about preservation and revitalization, leading to Epic Wen coming back in a matter of speaking. A sort of revival of Epic Wen began in 2009 when waters retreated. Word spread among former residents scattered across the world that the waters had receded, igniting a spark of hope. Driven by their shared love for Epic Wen, they formed an alliance and set their sights on reclaiming their lost paradise. The first steps called for clearing some of the ruins and debris left by the flood. Dilapidated houses and streets buried under layers of salt and sediment were identified with signs and plaques. It was a laborious and challenging process that required the collective efforts of the community, as well as the support of volunteers and local authorities. Now don't get me wrong, Epic Wen is still a ghost town, but this ghost town has brought a new wave of tourism to the area. Artists, photographers, adventurers, and nature lovers have flocked to Epic Wen, drawn by the hauntingly beautiful landscapes and the intriguing story of the town's resurgence from the depths. It's a site that leaves visitors mesmerized, contemplating how impermanent our human creations can be. I found out about this story when I was looking for photos and information about another story of devastation and tragedy, but this one was more personal. A lot of you out there listening don't know about the tragedy that we went through here in Cancun in the year 2005. In October of that year, Hurricane Wilma struck Cancun and stayed over Cancun for over 60 hours as a powerful Category 4 hurricane with sustained winds reaching up to 185 miles. That's 295 kilometers per hour. 60 hours. Two and a half days. The impact of Hurricane Wilma on Cancun and the surrounding area was devastating, resulting in extensive damage. The winds, storm surge, and flood damage affected everyone here for years and it eviscerated the tourism industry. In a few days, we went from prospering as one of the world's most successful tourism destinations to doing what we could do to survive. And if you don't want to take my word for it, just Google Hurricane Wilma Cancun sometime, and you might not believe your eyes. It looked like we had been bombed. While Hurricane Wilma caused significant damage and disruption, Cancun and the surrounding areas have since recovered and rebuilt. The tourism industry has rebounded, and the region remains a popular destination for travelers from all over the world. We saw firsthand what nature can do, but in our case, we also saw what people can do when they're resilient and work together to come back. Stories like Cancun and Epic Win can show us all how we can triumph over tragedy, and we're also reminded of the fragility of our own existence. The once vibrant town of Epic Wen, now a spectral reflection of its old self, isn't so much Atlantis as it is a powerful reminder of the unstoppable forces of nature and the impermanence of human achievement. Friends, as always, thank you and gracias for joining me here for another episode of the Mysteries of Latin America podcast. On our next episode, we'll delve into the mystery of the unsolved disappearance of two students in Panama less than 10 years ago. Now, if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to us. And make sure to tell a friend and share the podcast on social media if you're so inclined. We'd appreciate that 
so more people can hear stories about the myths, legends, ancient sites, and unsolved mysteries of Latin America. I'm Andrew Colon. Adios. Thank you.